All right. Um, this month happens to be Women's Month. And, uh, you know, it's interesting that our topic today, we're about to end this series, Faith Like No Other. And uh, we are going to look at a woman uh, in the scriptures on how God has used her. But before we go there, I just want to honor all the women. Can we just appreciate all the women in the house? Can we just give them a hand? Dakila kayo, you know. Thank you for what you do. You know, thank you for, uh, you know, being who you, uh, who God has made you to be. Whether it's, you know, a single person, a housewife, a mom, somebody's working in the corporate, uh, you know, uh, field, or, you know, you may be in the politics or in the judicial system. But nonetheless, God can use any one of us. And I, I do hope that this story will infi- inspire, will inspire and put fire uh, in our hearts about how God can use every one of us, particularly women, okay? So uh, once again, can we just give a hand to our women uh, in the house? And what a fitting way for us to be able to end this series. You know, society and culture have actually defined women differently through the, you know, many centuries. And uh, different cultures have different ways of treating uh, women, Um, You know, some have particularly, actually a lot of cultures in the past centuries, we see that women's roles were predominantly confined to the private sphere, which is inside the home or inside the family. You know, they were expected to prioritize family and household responsibilities. So, parang divide and conquer, the husband go out, you know, you know, you bring home the bacon, the women stay home and take care of the kids. Somehow that was like the expectation, often limited access to education, employment, and participation in public life. But how many of you know that today it's a little bit different culturally? Uh, we see a lot and lot more, uh, a lot more women uh, going out there and, uh, you know, doing... Uh, and really achieving a lot of things that used to, you know, what men used to just be doing. Uh, We see that in different sectors of society, they have been breaking glass ceilings like education, politics. We see women in politics. How many of you are involved in politics? If you are, uh, you know, if you're in the judicial system, uh, you know, I will allow you to say not judge, Lisa, no. But if you're in politics, you know, maybe you're in education, maybe you're in the science and technology field, uh, you know, um, even in the, sometimes in the mechanical field, which used to be dominated by men or a technical field, now we see more and more women that are entering into that field. Uh, astronauts, you know, back in the day, it's only men who are going flying out in the moon, but now we see women also are going out into outer space. Pilots, okay? Uh, I think we have some women pilots here in the uh, congregation. Uh, and so uh, we, I, we, I have, you know, I, we have a lot of uh, captains uh, flying planes here that are men. But now, uh, you know, I believe that God can use women as well in flying planes. So how many of you know that both uh, opportunities are available for men and women? One of the biggest blockbuster movie of last year in 2023 uh, was Barbie. Uh, I'm not sure if you as a woman played this when you were like a young girl. Uh, but, uh, you know, it just says here, here is, she's everything and he is just Ken. Okay? Portraying that women nowadays really are uh, experiencing a little bit more achievement. You know, you've got Pilot Barbie, you've got Dr. Barbie, you've got Secretary Barbie, you've got Politician Barbie, you've got different kinds of Barbie. Yet, uh, you know, this movie Barbie analyzes expectations for women and the female experience as a whole. But our story for today, as we look at the scripture, it's a look at a real-life story of a Jewish woman who was an orphan, who was adopted by her uncle, grew up in exile in the kingdom of Persia, and out of all the women in that kingdom was handpicked by God to be influential and eventually became a queen and God used to save the people of God called the Jews. And I'm referring to no less than Queen Esther. That's why Esther, 
Kamsamnida. <laughs> you know, we're going to be looking at the story of Queen Esther, and it's really an interesting story. In fact, this is not just fairy tale, it's not Hollywood, but somehow it took place in the days of the king. So, similar to a fairy tale, I kind of believe that Disney borrowed the theme from this particular book in the Bible. Because we see a king looking for a queen out of all the things, or out of all the women in the kingdom, you know, they were all in search for the right new queen for the king. So parang Cinderella story in effect. But yet, we see the story of one remarkable woman who was willing to be used by God, who said this beautiful words, if I perish, I perish. Sa Tagalog, patay. Kung patay. What a remarkable woman of faith. Faith like no other. We're going to be looking at the scriptures from Esther chapter 3. If you're not familiar with the book of Esther, you'll find that in the Old Testament. If you hit the middle of your Bible in the book of Psalms, turn left. After Job, turn a little bit more to the left. And I hope you'll see Esther. Let's all stand up as we read God's word this morning from Esther chapter 3. We'll be reading several verses to highlight the story of the book. But we're not, just, we're not going to take the time to read through the book because it's a rather long uh, story. But let me encourage you that when you get home tonight, read the book of Esther, 10 chapters. It will inspire you on how God can move in your life. Sometimes it could be obscure, the hand of God, but yet we know that God has been in uh, the background, and doing a lot of things behind the scenes. So Esther chapter 3, beginning in verse 12 to 14, then we'll be jumping in verse, uh, chapter 4, uh, 8 to 17. Esther chapter 3, verse 12. Then the king's scribes were summoned on the 13th day of the first month, and an edict, according to all that Haman commanded, was written to the king's sat- satraps, and to the governors over all the provinces, and to the officials of all the peoples, to every province in its own script, and every people in its own language. It was written in the name of King Ahasuerus. Uh, in the NIV, his name is King Circe. So you can actually interchange between Ahasuerus and King Circe, and sealed with the king's signet ring. Verse 13, letters were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces with instruction to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all Jews, young and old, women and children, in one day, the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. A copy of the document was to be issued as a decree in every province by proclamation to all the peoples to be ready for that day. Let's jump to the next chapter, Esther chapter 4, verse 8 to 17. Mordecai also gave him, or the king's eunuch, Hatach, uh, to go to Esther, one of the written decree issued in Susa for their destruction, that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her and command her to go to the king to beg his favor and plead with him on behalf of her people. And Hathach went and told Esther what Mordecai had said. And Esther spoke to Hathach and commanded him to go to Mordecai and said, All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is but one law to be put to death, except to the one whom the king holds out the golden scepter so that he may live. But as for me, I have not been called to come into the king's uh, in, in the into the king these thirty days. Verse twelve. And they told Mordecai what Esther had done, uh, said. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther: Do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. 
For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise from, uh, for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. And who knows? Everybody say, who knows? Who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go and gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on my behalf and do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my young women will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the preaching of your word this morning. I pray, God, that you would help us to understand uh, what is the implication of this particular story in the Bible and how it applies in our daily life today. Holy Spirit, speak to us today. Encourage your people today that even sometimes, Lord God, though we don't see you move in our midst, you are always there. You've always been moving in us, with us, among us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may all be seated. All right, so uh, just to give us a an broad stroke, an overview of the story of Esther, the book uh, that we are referring to, there are about five major characters in the book of Esther. Let's not talk about the different characters like the eunuch and all, but five major characters just so that we can have a better understanding what the story is all about. First is the Persian king Ahasuerus. Everyone say Ahasuerus. Well, you a shortcut, okay? Okay, nickname Ahas or something like that, okay? Or King Xerxes, okay? Uh, he is the Persian king, the most powerful king in the world at that time. Now, Persia defeated the nation of Babylon. Remember that Babylon took the Israelites into captivity, okay? And they were known as the Chaldeans. But when the Persians and the Medes... Uh, ganged up together, they defeated the Babylon, and basically they took over the kingdom, and their kingdom expanded from India to Ethiopia. It's a vast kingdom, 127 uh, provinces all in all. And so during the first uh, few um, Persian kings, they kind of allowed some of the people in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Persia, some of the Jews to go back into Jerusalem. So there were Jews that went back to Jerusalem. Remember Nehemiah? Remember Ezra? Those guys? So there were like two or three batches of people going back to Jerusalem. But there were people who decided to stay in Persia. Uh, mga OFWs. They decided to stay in the foreign land because they probably have good businesses already. They, you know, they are now prospering. They kind of like are settled here. And then there's a new king that came and his name is Xerxes. He expects his commands to be obeyed at all times. Second uh, character is Queen, Queen Vashti. Now, Queen Vashti, if you will uh, look at the first chapter, uh, we don't have time to go through the details, but Queen Vashti was the predecessor queen that Esther replaced. When the king was wanting to show off, now this king was really a show-off. You would read that in Esther chapter 1. For six months, he kind of like opened his kingdom to everybody who wants to come and see the splendor and the grandeur of his kingdom. So he was like giving them a tour. And at the end of the six months, he actually uh, organized a banquet for seven days and invited all the royal guests, royal of officials, and when the king was kind of like high in spirits, the Bible was saying he was high in spirits. In other words, lasheng, okay? Okay, stone, bangag, or something like that, okay? I mean, he was really, you know, not himself anymore. He said, I have shown everything about my kingdom. I haven't shown one thing. I want to show the highlight of my kingdom, which is my queen. The Bible says that he ordered Queen Vashti to come and parade herself in front of the different dignitaries that are guests in the kingdom. Now, some theologians are saying 
that there's a reason why Queen Vashti did not want to go out there. Because the Bible said that the king requested for the queen and her crown to be shown. What they were assuming was the king wanted her to go and parade herself without clothes, only the crown on her. It's, you know, it's not clear, but some of that was the assumption in the scripture. The, king, the queen and her crown, it was silent. And so the queen did not want to go out and parade herself before the dignitaries. Okay, this is one uh, school of thought by some theologians. And that's the reason why the queen did not want to go out and parade herself. We don't know if that's exactly the reason. Or she was just stubborn and said, I have my own party because she also had her own banquet. I have no time to show myself to the queen. And, and in other words, she did not... The king was mad and raged and he decided from here on I'm going to banish Queen Vashti and you're no longer to appear in my presence and let there be a search in all the kingdom for a new queen to replace Queen Vashti. That's a story, the summary. Third, uh, third uh, who's this? Uh, character is Haman. Everybody say Haman. Haman. Haman is actually a, an evil official in the kingdom. A Jew-hating person who was promoted into a high position. Uh, he was arrogant. He was expecting everybody to bow before him. And so he was like the second in command of the king, Xerxes. He was money-hungry. He hated Mordecai. And because he was kind of ticked off because of what Mordecai did. And this is the story why there was an edict that went out because Mordecai was not willing to bow before Haman. Haman said, not only will Mordecai pay for this, but Mordecai's people will pay for this. Every Jew in the kingdom is to be annihilated according to the decree that was signed no less than by the king. Of course, Haman manipulated the king and told the king another story. The king believed him, and so that was the situation. Mordecai, on the other hand, is the next uh, a character. Mordecai happens to be a Jew uh, who raised uh, Esther. Uh, he was like the uncle of Esther. Esther was um, an orphan, and Mordecai uh, took care of Esther. He was probably the one who taught Esther character and standards about God and so on and so forth. He refused to bow down to Haman, but yet he was loyal also to God and loyal to the king. Of course, the last, but not the least, the last and the most important character of the story is Queen Esther, whose uh, Hebrew name was Hadassah, but her uh, Persian name was changed to Esther which means star for all seasons. <laughs> and so she became queen. This really is a story of God's redemption for His people. And yet in the midst of the plans of the enemy, God chooses one obscure woman, a young woman at that, and used by God, thrust into prominence, so that she could influence the higher ups. One interesting fact about uh, fact about the book of Esther is, you will not find any mention of God in the whole book. You know, there's no reference to Jehovah. There's no reference to the Lord. There's no reference to people praying to Him. There's no reference to people searching the Scripture. Unlike any other book in the Bible, Esther is the only book where you would actually not find God being referred to, and no promises of God were claimed, no character in the book ever prayed. But how can this book be part of the canonized section of the Old Testament? If you're familiar with God's faithfulness and you know, His uh, her promises throughout history, you'll be convinced that the book of Esther is not without divine influence. That's why I encourage you to read through the book of Esther if you have the time later on. God is definitely, though He was not mentioned explicitly, 
he was definitely in the forefront or in the background of things, behind the scenes, but yet he was moving mightily uh, among the people of God in, in Esther, with Mordecai, the Jews, and so on and so forth. That's why as you read the beautiful narrative of uh, Esther, you will notice that this is not just a story of coincidence, but it's a story of providence. Not a story of coincidence, but a story of providence. Though God's name was not mentioned even once in the book of Esther, and yet you will see his fingerprints all over the story. In fact, Martin Luther had a problem with this book. He said, I wish that the book of Esther has not been written because of the no mention of God. But we know that God, even if he was not mentioned, we believe that he is the main character of this book and his divine influence is found in the lives of the characters there. Three thoughts I want to share with us this morning. Number one is God's providence. Everyone say God's providence. As I said earlier, this book begins with King Asuerus showing off his grandeur. We see the hand of God all throughout. And yet, out of all the ladies in the kingdom, so we see that the queen was vanished, Queen Vashti, and then they had a search for a new queen. So Miss Persia pageant was launched. The first beauty queen official a beauty queen uh, in the Bible was launched and women all over the kingdom of Persia were invited to participate and guess what? They were treated with the finest spa treatment that any woman can actually dream about. Six months of oil, six months of you know, milk and whatever. It's like a whole year. How many of you ladies would like to go through such beauty treatment? And it's free! if you have been pulled in as one of the candidates. And so Esther, from a beauty queen, became the Persian queen. He, she was chosen among all the beautiful women. They first, she not list she. And then they would actually, per, I don't know what they did. Okay? They went to the king, and the king would, you know, Look at them. And then we see that Esther was chosen by the king. In, in Esther chapter 2, verse 16 to 17, when Esther was taken to King Ahasuerus into his local, uh, royal palace in the 10th month, which is the month of Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign, the king loved Esther more than all the women, and she won grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. How many of you know that that reflects God's providence in the life of Esther? An orphan, a Jew at that. In fact, Mordecai told Esther, don't ever tell anyone that you are a Jew. Secret lang natin yan. But yet, despite that, God still used Esther. God's providence is seen when He takes the normal circumstances in life and weaves them together for His ultimate purpose. That is God's providence. Now, how many of you see God's providence in your life? You know, taking normal circumstances in your life, you going to this particular school, you growing up in this particular environment, you know, it's no accident that you grew up in that family, it's no accident what you have been through uh, in your family, how many siblings you have. You have probably gone through some trials and tragedies in your life. How many of you have gone through challenges and trials in your life? Please raise your hand. You've gone through trials and difficulties. Okay? Esther was no exempt. She was not exempt, ex exempted from that. She went through the most difficult situations, and yet God, through God's sovereignty and providence, used every situation to weave through the daily things in her life, not for Esther's purpose, but for God's ultimate purpose. How many of you know it's not about us, it's about God's purpose? But God, with His compassion and grace, He gets to use us and includes us as part of His story. God is not always overt or obvious in your life, but definitely He is moving and weaving things for His glory. How many of you know that He is not always audible and apparent? But yet, even if He is silent, 
He's always present. Even if you don't hear His voice, or even if you don't feel His presence, He is there in your midst. So rather than noticing what isn't there, notice what's there in your life. What do you have? What are you doing now? Where are you now? What's your station in life now? Because God is always working. God is always working in our midst. Amen. He's always moving. He's always present. He will never leave us nor forsake us. Amen. That's His promise to His people. John Nelson Darby, the author of the Darby translation, said this, God's ways are behind the scenes, but He moves all the scenes which He is behind. Though He is not seen in the BTS, behind the scenes, He moves all the scenes. He is the ultimate director. You know, I want to share a testimony of a woman that I know. Heard of this story of this woman who has gone through all the different kinds of trials in her life. And yet, today, if you talk to her, she says that God's hand was there to preserve her. She was born in the upper middle class business parents with business in furniture and taxi and trucking fleet. When she was young, she has tasted a bit of affluence at a very young age. Unfortunately, she lost her mom when she was seven years old to a violent truck accident. And she practically grew up without a mother. While she was grieving together with her family, their house burned down. After they saw it burn down, they rebuilt a house only to lose it again in a legal battle. And the newly built house was bulldozed right before their eyes because of the loss of the battle legally. After this, their father abandoned the family. He basically left them all children and went on to start another family on his own. The siblings, because they were still young, she was like below 10, they had to be farmed out to different houses, either to relatives or friends for survival. And she was recounting that at the age of 11, she would had to work and fend for herself. Like she remembers that they were, like, they were like three sisters in this particular house. The other siblings were in other houses. They were like more than 10 in the family. She would wake up in the morning at 3 a.m., go to the market, sell fish, go home, and attend classes in the afternoon. This is like her, her routine. Her older siblings had to work to take care of the other siblings so that they could all go to high school and college. Goodness and the grace of God was upon her. She got saved at the age of 18. She finished college, had a job. She got married at 22. After getting married, her father passed away. And as a Christian, we thought that things will go better in her life. She lost a child in her early 30s. And to date, she lost six of her siblings to different sicknesses in different times. Yet in all this, she acknowledges that she is loved by God and God has been good to her and has a purpose for her. And I'm privileged to be part of her story because it's a story of my wife, Shirley. And how she has been grateful in God ministering to her all throughout and if you talk to her, there's not even a hint of bitterness in her life with God, knowing that God has been there providentially in her life. She's grateful that she's being, using, being used by God today to minister to women and other uh, pastor's wives. And her story has actually helped uh, somehow inspire and bring hope to others. My question for us today is, do you see the hand of God in your life? 
Because our response ought to be, we can be grateful and confident, knowing that God is committed ultimately to fulfill His purpose in us and through us. That despite the fact that you and I have gone through in life, whatever it is, God is still good. Amen. Can we give the Lord praise for that? And I ask her permission if I can share this story because she has not publicly said this, but somehow I said, wow, you've been through a lot, but yet look at you, there's, no, there's still the joy of the Lord um, that you possess. Thank you, love. We also see God's purpose. You know, each of us has a purpose. Look at the person beside you and tell that person, you have a purpose. Just like Esther, you have a purpose. One life. Everybody say one life. One life can make a difference. The thing about Esther is this. Mordecai had to remind Esther that your position does not guarantee protection. Mordecai was a queen. Morde- uh, sorry, a quest, Esther, but Esther, Mordecai, not Mordecai, hindi siya queen, okay? Esther was a queen. Esther was supposed to think, you know, I'm kind of like secure in my position. I am a queen. Whatever I say, I get. In fact, King Cersei said, up to half of my kingdom is yours. But yet Mordecai reminded Esther, don't think that you're safe because you are there. And he reminded Esther, he said, don't, don't think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. Basically, what Mordecai was reminding Esther is Esther was not made queen just for her protection. She was made queen for a higher purpose. Guess what? You are in that position not just for your self-preservation. You are there, God placed you there for a higher purpose more than what you are doing right now. You are given a higher calling by God. Secondly, you know, some thoughts about God's purpose. Your indifference will not stop God's deliverance. God can use another person who's willing to obey if we would just stay in apathy. And, and you know, Mordecai reminded her, if you keep silent at this time, Relief and deliverance will rise from the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. That's why we can't stay in apathy because none of us is indispensable. God can use another person if we're not willing to give and to obey God. How many of you know that? Sa totoo lang, He does not need us in fulfilling His plan. But the good thing about this is God chooses us so that we could actually be part of the big plan. Another thought is your status is a divine place. And wherever you are, God place you there. Whatever it is that your position is in right now. Who knows? Mordecai said this. Who knows? Everybody, who knows? Who knows where you, whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. This is a kairos moment. It means an opportune time. It means a, a favorable time that God has been waiting for. And it occurs when God's time uh, to act in the midst of human involvement. He's about to do something really special. It's a kairos moment. Who knows that you have been chosen for such a time as this. Who knows that you are there in that company for such a time as this? Who knows that you are there in that campus for such a time as this? That God has placed you in that position for such a time as this. Not just for your safety, but for the greater good. Mark Twain, the American writer, said this, the two most important days in your life are the day you were born and the day you found out why. What is your purpose? We don't just live to exist. God has a purpose for us. Amen. Find out why God created you. God created you to be special. You're not just an ordinary individual. God, there's a special place for you. God wants you to do something great. 
no matter how small and insignificant it may be. Guess what? Your life testimony or your story does not have to be spectacular like Esther. It does not have to be spectacular. It could be normal. But yet God has placed you there for a reason. You may be a mom who's faithful to your husband, discipling the kids, and that's your purpose. And be great at that. You could be an employee in a call center and your purpose is just to share your testimony to your workmates and even reach out to your boss. If that's your purpose, be good at it. You may be a student in your campus. God placed you in that class or at campus for a reason. Be faithful in doing that. Another testimony is one of our women, uh, women leaders in church by the name of Vance Joey. Of course, we ask for their permission if you can share this. Now she is a nurse in one of our leading hospitals in BGC. When she was 16, she was invited to our youth service. Her family, as she described back then, was kind of like chaotic. And her parents knew that she was attending the youth uh, ministry. But yet they did not want to support her, you know, like she's going through one-to-one, but, you know, they were prohibiting her, but she still went anyway. They didn't want to give her allowance because they didn't want her to go, but she, you know, uh, she saved up so that she can still go continuously to the one-to-ones. She learned to share the gospel, and so she did with the classmates and friends. She was sharing the gospel all throughout, but her family still remained resistant to the gospel. In one of the conferences, she saw one of the testimonies of one particular student praying over the family, and that's exactly what she did. One time, she was praying over her family while they were sleeping. Pine pray over. Have a tutulog. Maborn again ka, maborn again kayo. Open heart, open heart, open heart. Lo and behold, she was able to invite her mom to the service, and she gave her life to the Lord. She's now an usher of our service, Uh, you know, worshiping the Lord, serving the entire family is now attending church. In fact, one of her sisters whom she reached out is one of our newest campus missionaries in the church. How many of you that God can use anyone for His purpose? Esther's response was this. She said in verse 16 of chapter 4, Go and gather all the Jews all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on my behalf. And do not eat. Hindi lang ako mahihirapan dito. Tayo lahat, sama-sama. Hindi ako kakain. Wag rin ko bahay. She was calling for a fast. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day, and I and my women will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law. If I perish, then I perish. You know, God used one woman, but yet God used the entire community to stand with her. It's a community thing. They all fasted together. They all did something to make a difference. They all sacrificed so that they could plead for the mercy and for the life of the Jews. One life can make a difference, but everybody has a role to play in this. And she said these beautiful words, If I perish... I perish. My question for us is, are you willing to obey to the point of death? She was willing to sacrifice her life so that she can save her own people. Crazy faith that believes that God will ultimately deliver. Psalm 34 is reminded of this particular verse as she was saying this. Verse 4 says, I sought the Lord and He answered me and delivered me from all my fears. So those who look to Him are radiant and their face shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of his troubles. And the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. If we ask the Lord, if we pray, how many of you God's deliverance is at hand? Amen. My last point as I come to a close is God's promises. Everybody say God's promises. God's promises. How many of you know that God's promises is faithful and true? His Faithful to fulfill his promise. Verse uh, 14, uh, Mordecai said this, If you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house may perish. 
Mordecai was almost so sure that God will deliver his people from destruction. In fact, it all goes back to God's promise to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. And it was kind of reminding Esther, guess what? We're still part of that promise. Back in the day when God called Abraham, that God was committed to fulfill His promise to Abraham and his future descendants. And this was the promise of God in Genesis chapter 12. He said, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. And I will make your name great and you will be a blessing and I will bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse and all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And then in verse 7, he said, The Lord appeared to Abraham and said, To your offspring, I will give this land. Guess what? Mordecai and Esther and the Jews in the Persian Empire were part of Abraham's offspring. God has been... How many of you know that by faith we're also part of Abraham's offspring? Amen. And the promise of God in Esther can be summarized by the acronym LOB. Very simple. We see that in the promise of God. LOB, land, offspring, blessing. That's it. The promise of God to Abraham and through Abraham to all his offspring is land. I'll give you a land of promise. Offspring, you will be multiplying and be blessing. How many of you know that because of Abraham, you and I also have been blessed because of our faith? In Christ. Amen. We are extended of that same blessing. And if we humble ourselves before God, He will come and deliver us. And God's overall plan for His people is to preserve them and bring them back to the land of promise. I'd like to ask the music team to join me here on stage as I come to a close. You know, trust, how do we respond? Trust God's promises even if it is far fetched. One final testimony as I come to a close. You probably heard of the story of Doc Jazzy Burgos. She is a medical doctor, a professor, medical director in one of the leading pharmaceutical companies in the Philippines. And somehow, God used her in opening a lot of doors uh, to share the gospel in church and even outside church. She's being used right now in campuses. She's being used right now in government agencies. She's used also in uh, you know, private companies. She specializes in molecular and nutritional oncology and clinic, uh, clinical nutrition. But God opened doors for her to minister on mental health, leadership, womanhood, gender and sexuality, and some other topics. God can use any one of us if we are willing to obey and say, God, I'm willing to go. As I close... Esther said these words, if I perish, I perish. What she is saying really is, not my will, but your will be done. And she was willing to sacrifice her position as a queen in order to save her people from annihilation and destruction. If you read further, eventually we see that she had an audience with the king she was able to clarify the evil plan of Haman. The king discovered it was Haman. Ultimately, Haman was hanged in the gallows that he created. And after that, all the people of God got saved because they were able to put Mordecai into a high position and they were able to put a new decree to protect themselves against any impending attack on the 12th month of Adar. And we can see that in the final chapters of the book of Esther, it's all about God's victory for His people and banquets and celebration. Thus, the Feast of Purim or Purim was inaugurated during that time as a reminder that God will always save His people from destruction. And even till today, God's people, the Jews, are still celebrating that Feast of Purim in remind, to remind themselves of what happened during the time of Esther. She said, if I perish... I perish. Not my will, but your will be done. We see a similar story in the Garden of Gethsemane wherein a king had to lay down his crown. And he said to God, Lord, if it's your will, can you take this cup away from me? But yet, not my will, but your will be done. It's almost like Jesus on that garden was saying, Lord, 
Yes, if I perish, I perish. Esther was spared from being annihilated. Jesus was not. He perished. He died, went to the cross, paid the price so that you and I could be saved from the ultimate destruction of the Spirit. That those who put their faith in the finished work of Christ on the cross will be saved and have eternal life.